Just two days before Christmas on December 23, 1933, when a journey that began with holiday cheer ended in unimaginable tragedy. In the blink of an eye, two trains collided near the small town of Pompon, France, turning joyful plans into chaos. What went wrong? What caused this sudden disaster? 200 people dead and 120 were injured. Stay with us in this video. We'll reveal the events that led to the second worst railway disaster in French history. Before we dive into the background of this tragic train disaster, I invite you to subscribe this channel and hit the notification bell so you don't miss any of our train disaster documentaries. Pompon is a small town in northern France with about 4,168 residents as of 2020. It is located in the Ile de France region, 106 kilometers southwest of Rheims and 25 kilometers east of Paris. Pompon is located along the Paris Est to Strasbourg Ville Railway, a main line connecting Paris to Strasbourg near the German border. The line opened in sections between 1849 and 1852 and has been electrified since 1962. Originally operated by the Est Company, a private French rail operator, parts of the line changed ownership between France and Germany multiple times over the years. This history is still visible at Sarabourg, where the tracks switch sides due to different traffic patterns in each country. Service number 55 was a special regional passenger train from Paris to Nancy, added to handle the extra holiday traffic before Christmas. Due to the high demand, the East Company had to use older wooden passenger cars since they were running low on modern carriages. Service number 25 was an express train traveling from Paris to Strasbourg, made up of several express passenger cars pulled by the S241.017 steam locomotive. The S241 class, introduced between 1925 and 1930, was designed to handle the heavier all-steel passenger cars while maintaining higher speeds. These locomotives followed a 482 mountain design, with two leading axles, four driving axles, and one trailing axle. They also carried a four-axle tender, with up to 8.5 metric tons of coal. Each locomotive, including the tender, was 86 feet long and weighed 195 metric tons, with a power output of 3,452 horsepower and a top speed of 120 kilometers per hour. They were the most powerful steam locomotives in Europe at the time. On December 23, 1933, Paris was hit with bitter cold and heavy fog, making travel difficult. The East Company had added extra trains to handle the Christmas rush, but the bad weather was already causing delays and confusion. One of these extra trains was service number 55, a crowded regional train traveling from Gare de l'Est station in Paris to Nancy, 285 kilometers to the east. Scheduled to leave at 5.49 p.m., the train didn't depart until 7.22 p.m., running well behind schedule. The first part of the trip went smoothly until it reached Verres sur marne where the line narrows from four tracks to two. At this point, service number 55 had to stop at a red signal to allow a rail bus waiting on the outer track to depart first further delaying its journey. The Paris-Strasbourg express train was also running late, leaving Paris at 7.29 p.m. instead of the planned 6.16 p.m. This express train, which made only a few stops, was now speeding toward Pompon at 110 kilometers per hour through thick fog. Track signals had instructed the express to stop at Verre sur marne because the regional train ahead had stopped, but it failed to do so and sped through the station without slowing down. At 8.12 p.m., just as service number 55 started moving again, the express train slammed into the back of the regional train near Pompon. The heavy locomotive smashed through the wooden carriages at the rear of the regional train, completely destroying five cars until the wreckage piled up. That the express train finally slowed down enough to stop both trains. The impact was devastating. 204 people all aboard the regional train, lost their lives and more than 120 were injured. Some sources report even higher numbers, claiming as many as 230 fatalities and 500 injured, but 204 remains the most widely accepted figure. Passengers in the rear cars of the regional train had no chance of survival. 
the wooden cars were completely shattered, leaving only broken wood and bent steel frames. Some of the wreckage landed on the adjacent track, accidentally connecting the rails. This triggered the signal system to mark the track as occupied, which stopped an approaching train just in time to avoid another disaster. When police arrived at the scene, they were overwhelmed by the scale of the tragedy. Desperate to get the injured to hospitals, officers began seizing private cars from locals to transport the wounded. Priests and bishops arrived to bless the deceased, whose bodies were taken to Gare de Les Station, where a luggage hall was converted into a temporary morgue. Survivors, some injured and in shock, had to wait for hours to be evacuated. Responders built fires using debris from the wrecked train cars. But even with the fires, some survivors reportedly suffered from hypothermia due to the freezing winter conditions. The investigation quickly focused on the express train's crew, blaming them for missing a stop signal and causing the accident. However, the fireman, Mr. Daubigny, denied this claim, insisting that all signals had shown clear. He said they only realized something was wrong when they saw the red lights at the back of the regional train, and by then it was too late to stop. The driver, Mr. Charpentier, supported this account, but despite their statements, the public prosecutor charged both men with manslaughter and had them detained. This sparked outrage among unions leading to widespread protests. Under pressure, authorities released the two men after four days in custody. During the investigation, the driver, Mr. Charpentier, was examined by an eye doctor who diagnosed him with color blindness. This, along with the fact that he was not responsible for monitoring signals, led to the charges against him being dropped. Even if he had checked the signals, he wouldn't have been able to identify the colors correctly. However, Mr. Daubigny, the fireman, was put on trial. Authorities argued that he ignored signals and failed to slow the train to a safer speed, especially given the heavy fog that night. The investigation also uncovered issues with the signaling system. Two different systems were being used along the route, even though they weren't designed to work together. From Paris to Vares Station, standard light signals were in place. Beyond Vares, older physical signals were used, metal paddles illuminated by petroleum lamps shining through tinted glass. However, these signals didn't follow the color system we use today. With green for clear, yellow for slow, expect stop, and red for stop. This modern system, known as the Verlant Code, was introduced in 1926 by engineer Mr. Verlant. The government gave railway companies five years to switch to the new system, but the East Company had not yet completed the transition by the time of the accident. The four kilometers before Pompon did not have a unified signaling system in place. Three key signals, numbered 13, 15, and 17, used white lights for clear and a combination of green and red lights for stop. Between these, repeater signals displayed white for clear and two green lights for expect stop. The prosecution argued that Mr. Daubigny either ignored the signals or misunderstood them, thinking green meant clear, possibly due to his high speed giving him only a quick view of each signal. In his defense, Mr. Daubigny claimed the white lights were difficult to see in the thick fog, which could explain why he thought all signals showed clear. An expert who inspected the signals after the accident stated it was highly unlikely the signals worked correctly for the regional train, malfunctioned for the express, and then somehow returned to normal when investigators arrived. This added doubt to the prosecution's case, suggesting the signals may not have functioned as intended during the express train's approach. The doctor who examined Mr. Charpentier also evaluated Mr. Daubigny and confirmed that his vision was sharper than average, meaning he should have been able to spot signals earlier than most firemen. Additionally, Mr. Daubigny had a spotless record, with no prior incidents of ignoring stop signals throughout his long career. To complicate matters further, investigators discovered that Signal 15 had malfunctioned five weeks after the accident, displaying the wrong signal during ongoing inquiries. The investigation also looked into the crocodiles, steel beams installed on the tracks. These beams made contact with metal brushes beneath locomotives, completing a circuit to transmit signals. If the associated signal was set to stop, 
the crocodile would send a 20-volt current to the train, triggering a whistle inside the locomotive, which the crew had to reset. Both the whistle and its reset were recorded on the train's Flamen data recorder. In case of an electrical failure, explosive capsules would be placed on the track. If the train ran over these capsules, they would detonate with a loud boom, signaling the crew to come to an immediate stop. An inspection of the express train's data recorder revealed that no signal data had been logged, and the crew reported that they never heard a whistle inside the cab, nor did they reset one. Some survivors mentioned hearing a loud bang, likely from the explosive capsules on the track, but not when the locomotive passed the signals. Instead, the sound came much later, when the bistro car rolled over the same spot. This suggested that if the system switched to stop mode, it did so too late possibly meaning the signal was showing clear when the locomotive passed. The investigation found that ice buildup from the fog and condensation might have interfered with the signal system. Ice could have formed on the relays or mechanical linkages that connected the signals to the crocodiles, preventing them from working properly. Typically, workers applied oil to these components on cold nights to prevent freezing, but the East Company had recently decided to stop this practice as an experiment. The lead engineer admitted that conditions that night could have caused up to three millimeters of ice buildup, which might have blocked the relays. This meant the signal could have shown clear, even though it was set to stop. Believing the path ahead was clear, Mr. Daubigny did not slow the train. Since the train ahead was an irregular service, he likely had no reason to expect it at that location. The passing locomotive's vibrations might have loosened the frozen signal components, triggering the explosive detonators too late when the bistro car rolled over them. By that point, the loud detonation would have been too far back for the locomotive crew to hear over the noise of the steam engine. Mr. Daubigny went on trial for manslaughter in late December 1934, almost exactly a year after the accident. Engineers from the East Company insisted the signals had worked properly and blamed Daubigny for not following them. However, other technicians supported the theory that the signals had failed, with some firemen testifying about similar signal issues they had seen in the past. The public prosecutor eventually admitted there were doubts about the case and argued for a manslaughter charge with reduced penalties. However, the judge told the jury that convicting someone based on two conflicting theories was not justifiable. He reminded them that if there was reasonable doubt, it must benefit the defendant. On January 24, 1935, the jury found Mr. Daubigny not guilty, clearing him of all charges, as the court ruled that the available evidence was not strong enough to convict him. After the accident, the French signaling system underwent an urgent overhaul, with a switch to the exclusive use of the new Verlant code. Key changes included replacing two green lights on pre-signals with a single yellow light, the stop signal became a single red light instead of red and green, and clear changed from white to green for better visibility. Combination signals, which functioned as both main and pre-signals, were redesigned to be easier to read, and all signals were upgraded from dim petroleum lamps to brighter electric bulbs. The French government also ordered railway companies to gradually phase out wooden passenger cars, though this process wasn't completed until 1962, due to delays caused by World War II. A modernized version of the crocodile signaling system remains in use in Belgium, the Netherlands, and France today, although it is slowly being replaced by more advanced internationally standardized systems. The 1933 Pompon train collision was a turning point in railway safety, leaving behind lessons that shaped modern signaling and passenger safety systems. But even with the improvements made since then, it raises important questions. How much responsibility lies with human error, and how much with flawed systems? Could this disaster have been prevented, or was it inevitable given the conditions of the time? We'd love to hear your thoughts. Do you think Mr. Daubigny was treated fairly in the investigation? And what are your opinions on the shift from wooden passenger cars to safer designs? Too late? or just in time? Let us know in the comments below. If you found this story intriguing, make sure to like, share, and subscribe to help us continue bringing untold stories like this to light.